What we're looking at here is the canopy for the top turret for the B-17. It's uh, for an A-1B turret, which is what we're hoping to install on our airplane in a, hopefully about a, six months to a year. A um, particular story about this turret is uh, we got a phone call, gosh, January two years ago from somebody deep involved in the B-17 community saying, hey, I saw where somebody had found a top turret out in the woods. You guys need to follow up on this and see if it's useful for you because these things just don't grow on trees, literally. And uh, they sent me the link to the newspaper article that was written and much to my amazement, it was from a hometown newspaper from about five miles from where I grew up. And uh, I got the phone number and I got I chased down the, uh, the author of the article and I said, hey, what is going on with this? There was a picture of this thing uh, buried in the woods where it looked like they had used this as like a little playhouse for kids. Because this was about three feet off the ground and they were running in, running in and out of it and everything. And um, it was next to an abandoned house in a nature preserve in Northeast Ohio. And the lady told me that, uh, uh, yes, they found it. They contacted a local museum up in uh, Akron, Canton, Ohio, called the uh, MAPS Museum, Military Aviation Preservation Society, a wonderful little museum at Akron, Canton Airport. You should go see it, by the way. Um, and they had given it to them. Um, and so I contacted that museum. Um, uh, a fellow by the name of Kim, Kim Kaveshi, I'm sorry if I mispronounced his name, was the curator there. I called him on the phone, introduced him, told him who I was, what we were doing, asked him if they had plans for the turret. And they said, well, we don't have a B-17, uh, so we really don't have any plans for it. And I asked him if he'd be willing to part with it if it were in any type of shape. He said, yeah, we'd absolutely uh, like to see it go back where it belongs. So uh, I, I made a plane reservation. I flew home to see mom, and I drove down uh, in January, of, I guess it must have been 2012, or even 2011, to go take a look at this thing. And when I got there, it was a complete rusted out piece of garbage that I was thinking, man, this thing isn't worth my fl flight to come up here. But I took a bunch of pictures of it and sent them back to the people uh, here at the museum and the guy that gave us the initial lead on the, on the item. And he said, oh, you got to get that thing. That thing is worth a lot of money. And yes, we can fix it. We can restore it. No problem. So um, we made arrangements with the museum. Uh, they just gave it to us. And uh, we sent some people up in a truck to pick it up. And we brought it back home. And we started uh, uh, re rebuilding it. And uh, the top part here was actually in pretty good shape once we scraped down through the roughs. We uh, got a corporate donation from the uh, POR15 company, which is a, uh, a company known for making a rust preventative uh, paint that is widely used in the muscle car and, and classic car uh, uh, area. So the, the whole thing was ground down to bare metal and painted with this POR15 paint at the bottom. And then we've uh, put uh, body filler in to, to make it all nice and smooth and pretty. And uh, she's coming back to life as a, uh, the centerpiece uh, for our airplane. This is uh, what we call the top turret tub. This is what the canopy top sits on and uh, becomes the gun mount platform for the top turret for the, uh, uh, the B-17. This part was also found in that uh, nature preserve up in Northeast Ohio. As you can see, we're doing some modifications to it. Uh, we found that uh, this section of the turret had been removed at one point in time. And this is kind of a very critical uh, uh, mounting for all the hydraulic motors and the, and the electric motor that drives this thing. We've been very, very fortunate to have this piece here made by a gentleman up in Connecticut that uh, just drove past the museum one day, saw the airplane out in the, uh, the courtyard in the back, came in, walked around, saw our B-17 inside got totally enamored with it said he wanted to help. This guy owns a machine shop up in uh, Connecticut. So he made this beautiful piece of, uh, of aluminum uh, at no charge to us, flown down here several times, helped install it. I mean, the guy just went above and beyond. And uh, he made this beautiful piece that we are now covering up with body putty so that it disappears into the rest of the, uh, the turret so that it looks like it came off the factory back in uh, 1944, whenever this thing was made. This little jewel here has been uh, basically the product of the last year of my life. 
This is the ball turret underneath the belly of the B-17. Um, we just installed this last week, last Tuesday as a matter of fact. It's still kind of under construction here, no glass or anything. We have all the glass, we're just not to mess around with it. But um, a year ago, I drove out to uh, California to pick this thing up from uh, uh, a person that had it. It was uh, pretty much complete from a ball turret perspective. It actually was used in a movie, uh, the Memphis Bell movie. Um, as a movie prop and therefore it had been modified somewhat by the movie company. Uh, we were expecting this thing to be almost complete but when we actually got out there we found that the electric motor and the two hydraulic pumps and several other pieces of equipment had been uh, removed and actually replaced with plastic movie prop type equipment. So right off the bat we were missing the heart and soul of the airplane, the, the, the motor and the hydraulic pumps. So we kind of took a step back and we started listing all the different parts we needed to bring it back to life um, and we start putting feelers out to all the World War II warbird uh, collectors and parts aficionados and everybody that's in the business and little by little we started getting finding the stuff that we needed to fill in the gaps um, I had a big spreadsheet going of all the different parts we needed with diagrams I'd send them out to people and say hey we're looking for one of these um, and uh, we finally got everything pretty much where we needed to. In the meantime, we had taken the, the turret completely apart down to the last uh, fastener, washer, screw, nut, and bolt. Took it apart, cleaned it, repainted everything that needed to be repainted. We had a local um, body shop actually donate their time to painting of the interior. Um, the color that's painted on the inside, I don't know if you can see it real well here, But this kind of a soft, almost a light sky blue is the exact color that these, these um, ball turrets were painted when they came off the assembly line. And the reason we know that is the color was matched to a part that came off of a B-17 that had gotten stranded in Greenland on its way to World War II back in 1944 or 45, somewhere in that ball, ballpark, and got buried in a glacier and was there for 60 or 70 years when it finally got uncovered and was salvaged and the person that that got the ball turret used this to make uh, uh, color charts or color uh, copies from a, an actual piece that had never seen sunshine or ultraviolet light or whatever so we know it's an authentic color um, but as you can see we've done a lot of work in here everything's pretty much uh, uh, where it belongs everything works now we just need to finish the, the electrical work to it and this thing will run on you know by itself like the way it was designed. Another interesting story here is even though we we you know did a really good job of scrounging parts and everything, not everything was readily available. Um, there's a big gear that goes up on the belly of the aircraft that allows this thing to spin and it's made out of solid brass and it's about 44 or 45 inches in diameter, about this big. You just don't find those things laying around. Out of the blue, the, the museum got a phone call, and it was a uh, the daughter of a B-17 uh, veteran whose father had passed away, and she had some stuff out in an old storage building and wanted to know if we'd be interested in it. So somehow or other, the phone got uh, the message got to me because it was ball turret related. So I called the lady back. She lived in Wisconsin. And turned out that her, her father at one time had an entire ball turret in his basement. Just as a conversation piece, I guess, you know? I mean, how many people actually have a full ball turret in their basement? Well, this guy did. And uh, that turret had since gone to another uh, B-17 organization, but she still had some other stuff out in her shop. And, you know, she saw something about our airplane and she thought, well, maybe we could use it. So actually, I got her to send me some pictures. And sure enough, one of those items that she had was that brass ring. And it's like, oh my God, how much do you want for it? She goes, I don't want anything. I just want to give it to you guys. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we'll take that. Thank you very much. So she sent it to us. And um, 
she, uh, I keep sending her pictures and all the stuff, and I'm, I want her to come and visit uh, to see where this piece that was her father's is now going to be in the belly of our airplane. And if we go inside, I can show you what, what that looks like, too, because it's, it's a really, really cool story about how this thing came together. This is the inside of the airplane now. We're looking at the ball turret. This is that big, beautiful brass ring I was talking to you about that uh, Miss Jerry donated to us and will sit here for perpetuity, basically, as a part of the, uh, uh, the display, the tribute to the men that uh, fought these magnificent machines. Um, <clears throat> another piece of the puzzle that we had to, to conquer was this support post. We didn't have one. Um, not many people have these things laying around, but what we did is we had pictures of these items and uh, I'm actually going to Savannah Technical College to work on some AutoCAD type stuff and I, I started doing this design and then I talked to the guys in the machine shop uh, out of Savannah Tech and they said, oh, we can build that. Lo and behold, we now have a partnership with Savannah Technical College. We, have, uh, we had some interns this past semester that did a lot of drawing for us. The machine shop guys made this collar, this threaded pipe, and this assembly up here, and uh, absolutely beautiful. So, I mean, again, it's taken a whole coordinated relationship with a lot of different people to make this thing come together. But uh, here she sits, and I'm very, very proud of this uh, thing. I'm like a proud father showing off his offspring. And I can't wait to come back here 60, you know, when I'm 60, 70, 80 years old. And, come up to this thing and say, yep, I built that. This is my baby. This is the radio operator's room in the B-17. It's right smack in the middle of the airplane. I'm standing in the bomb bay, uh, which is just behind the cockpit. We're just in front of where the ball turret sits. Um, this is one of the first rooms that we finished, basically, on this B-17. And we had a lot of help from our local amateur radio uh, society. Um, they actually refurbished many of these radio pieces and we actually have this as an operating radio station. We have our own FCC call sign. We actually transmit and receive on special occasions. Um, we have an antenna that runs out through the wingtip and outside to a long wire antenna and uh, the guys take quite a bit of pride in uh, uh, being able to operate this uh, for like Veterans Day and um, Air Force Birthday and other uh, special occasions is when we'll fire this thing up. A lot of wood in the airplane. Um, all the floors are wood, um, and uh, the desks obviously were wood. And uh, our our crew here, we actually built the entire wooden uh, interior for another B-17 that's on display at Barksdale Air Force Base, the Miss Liberty. Um, we built all the wooden ammo boxes, all the oxygen bottle holders, the desks, the floors. When the plane, we originally got the plane, it had no tail section on it, it was blocked off from the Smithsonian. And we were able to get the tail section here, which was up in Alaska, a crash in Alaska. And you can see how it eroded over the years. We were able to make arrangements with the uh, Dayton Force Base, who controls the Air Force, all the parts. And we were able to get a Stinger, exact duplicate of what we needed. So I went up, and Daryl and I went up to the Air Force Base and picked up the Stinger, we brought it down, and our super guys down here in the uh, metal shop has completely duplicated this whole tail section. It's called the Cheyenne. The reason we had to get a duplicate was there was no actually no plans from when they were originally built, the Cheyenne model. There was none, we couldn't have no plans. Well, we got plans for the rest of the plane, but none for the Cheyenne tail section. So the guys actually took the old part, one apart from Dayton, reconstructed this one. And then we shipped it back up to Dayton. Our metal shop guys did a fantastic job on reconstructing this whole Cheyenne tail section. This, this section turns for the gun stand. There will be two vertical slots put into this ball. Once we get the guns up, we have, they were two different versions of the gun mounts and depending on what gun mount you had versions to what the width where these gun slots are. And we have the gun mounts in here we've reconstructed. So we put them, once we find out what that distance is, then we'll, we'll cut these pieces out and mount the guns will go in the back here. Then there's another leather shroud that goes around the outside of it to seal it. This is one what the guns will be mounted into, into the ship. 
and we're reconstructing the mounts that they go on to. All this done, guys, down at the tech center has built this stuff for it, and we get this all welded up. And once we find out, because one goes on one side, and the other gun goes on the other side, and once we find that distance, then that's what will dictate as to what we cut the slots in the uh, ball we were seeing out there previously. about B-17 pilot training. Well, largely it's a matter of putting across what we know about the airplane, what it'll do and what it shouldn't be asked to do. Maybe airplanes are like people. You don't really get to know them until after you've lived with them a while. It takes time, too, to get well acquainted with an airplane. Time to find out just how far you can go with her and still stay friends. That's important. And men like our instructor have lived with this airplane long enough to become pretty good friends with her. So his job is just a matter of giving you the benefit of his experience. The procedure is pretty well standardized, and you'll learn to be thankful for that. Routine, like this circle tour of the airplane at the start, for instance, makes the student's life a lot simpler. In the cockpit, you'll learn to follow the checklist, because it helps you to keep your mind on your work. Detail's important when you're flying a big bomber. And using the checklist means you don't overlook a thing. After you get the plane off the ramp and down near the runway, you're ready for the run-up. One of the most important checks of all. Center at an angle. That gets all your props safe over concrete for the run-up. And if there's a guy behind you, you won't blast him when you rev him up. As your co-pilot, the instructor locks the tail wheel while she's rolling, so that when the wheel's in line, the lock pin will drop into place. Tail wheel locked, and... Brakes! Brakes set! Maybe here you'll switch to interphone. Easier to talk that way. Then the checklist again, and the instructor's command to check trim tabs. Set them at zero. Elevator trim tab. Rudder. Aileron. Then? Before the run-up, always check your oil temperature. You ought to have at least 40 degrees before beginning the run-up. Why not close cow flaps and hurry it up a little? It might mean trouble. If you close them, you get uneven cooling, local hot spots, metal fatigue. I get it. Just like bending a wire back and forth until it breaks. That's it. Exercise turbos? Right. You advance throttles to 1500 RPM for turbo exercise. And you know why it's important. To get warm oil circulating through the turbo regulators. If regulator oil is stiff or congealed, the turbo waste gates won't react properly. One avoidable cause of a runaway turbo on takeoff. Leaving turbos on, you do a repeat on the props. Give them plenty of time to change pitch. Watch the tax for that. If it's below freezing, exercise both turbos and props four times. Set the lock to keep the levers from creeping. And then, turbos off. And before the mag check, another important detail. Before you rev them up, turn on your generators and check each one for ampere output. If they balance, they're all putting out all right. Ampere output, okay. Now voltage and then turn them off. Twenty-five 
28 and a half on each. Generators checked and off. Check mags at 28 inches, starting with number one. While you're boosting manifold pressure, you remember there's a backfire hazard during the mag check. So you check turbos off, waste gates open, just to be sure. Oh, left. Don't watch the tank, watch the engine. Roughness doesn't always give you a quick drop in RPM. Both. Right. Both. Throttle up to the stop. A quick check of manifold pressure, and then full turbo. Since you're using 91 grade fuel here, you can't draw 46 inches. Power's cut about 10%. You set your lock. Check RPM little below 2,500 on this fuel. Take a look at the engine, and everything okay. Back slowly on the throttle because of the induction backfire hazard. Same procedure on all engines. Back to command to call the tower for takeoff clearance, and you're off to the races. Tail wheel. Parking brakes. Hold it with your feet on the runway. Less hazard if you have to get away fast. Gyro. Set the gyro compass and check your compass heading against the heading of the runway. Gyro set. Generators. Generators on. Tell we're locked. Light out. Now let's see your rider. Three point takeoff. Three point? Three point. Hold the tail down, but don't give it enough pressure to cause a lot of wheel drag. And remember, you fly the airplane. I'll watch the engine. The cow flaps open? Right. Hold the brakes until you get 25 inches, then let her go. You'll have rudder control by the time you're hitting 50 miles an hour. With a crosswind, you might have to use the throttles a little. Rudder's enough today. On 100 octane, you'd be using 46 inches and 2,500 RPM. Little less than that with this fuel. You'll leave the ground at around 100 miles an hour. a kick on the brakes to stop the wheel spin and gear up. Get rid of that drag fast. In takeoff emergencies, the bare belly is better than wheels. Check the light. Visual inspection later. 130 safe airspeed for power reduction. Manifold pressure first. Pilot's job, but today your instructor does it. Then RPM. You'll find it all in the tech orders and your checklist. Co-pilot trails call flaps, returning each valve to the locked position. Check your landing gear. Up left. Up right. And when your flight engineer gets an OK on the tail wheel, the switch is returned to neutral. Things happen fast on the takeoff, and it's easy enough to tense up a little. You did well enough, but... Don't fight her, she won't throw you. On our next takeoff, you'll reduce power. I'll just make the final adjustments. Hold your airspeed to 135 on the climb. What's our power setting? 35 inches, 2300. Let's switch back to interphone again. Do you always use this power setting for climbing? Yes, with 91 grade fuel and up to 30,000 feet. If you're climbing on instruments, you should hold your airspeed at 160. Are you keeping her trimmed? Turbo and throttle settings always depend on altitude. For instance, if we'd taken off from a sea level field, we wouldn't need turbo or even full throttle for the early part of the climb. Another thing, always cut down manifold pressure before RPM. 
What's your altitude? We're nearly a thousand feet above the field. Fuel boost pumps off? At uh, 1,000 minimum. Check fuel pressure before and after. Gives you another check on engine fuel pump operation. Look at your manifold pressure. Manifold pressure will creep up steadily on the climb if you don't watch it. As free air pressure decreases on the climb, the pressure differential across the turbo buckets increases. Gives you higher turbo speed and more pressure from the blower. What about carburetor air filters? Turn them off at 8,000. Don't often hit dust above that. In emergencies, though, you can use them up to 15,000. Dust that high? No, not dust. Carburetor icing conditions. So now they're ice filters? Mm, in a way, yes. Filters off. Filters take air from inside the wing. In the kind of weather that ices up carburetors, air inside the wing is drier and warmer than that you'd get from the ram air intake. Fill the lights green, filters off. Uh, check your manifold pressure. Turning the filters off increases the manifold pressure about an inch and a half. With carburetor icing conditions, of course, you'd use intercoolers hot. But you won't normally get carburetor icing above 12,000. And up there, you'll always want intercoolers cold. Thin air means higher rate of compression from the supercharger, and compression makes heat. In the wrong places? It's nearly always in the wrong places. You level off at 10,000 feet and cut her down to the proper setting for maximum long-range performance on 91-grade fuel. Manifold pressure down first to 28 inches. RPM next. You make this adjustment with one eye on the airspeed indicator because you use whatever RPM needed to get 150 miles per hour indicated. In this case, with your conditions, 1600 RPM. Then fuel mixtures to auto lean. And your co-pilot closes cowl flaps since you have a safe margin in head temperatures. What about the other power settings? Well, you've used three, modified for 91 grade fuel. Takeoff power, five minutes maximum continuous operation, climbing power, and maximum long range. They're all there on the panel. The power setting used in normal cruising is always figured from your flight conditions. Desired range, fuel available, weather conditions, altitude, gross weight, and perhaps one or two other things. In special cases, you'll always figure your best power setting from your flight computer. All settings are arrived at scientifically. Don't improvise. Plan the way they're written. And always keep an eye on your mixtures. In auto lean, don't use more than 29 inches with 91 grade and 2,000 RPM. Explain something? Try to. That three-point takeoff. What about it? Didn't it feel right? Well, maybe I didn't pull it right. I thought it was a little mushy. Isn't it better with the tail up? Well... And what about the stall hazard? Maybe we'd better figure it out on paper. Well, here we are. An old friend you'll remember from flying school days. She knows her way around. Call her tail up Myrtle. Now, take it easy, Myrtle. When Myrtle's parked on the ground, she's sure enough in a stalling or near stalling attitude. So on the takeoff, you lift the tail both to decrease drag and get a safe margin below the stall angle. And she takes off like a nice baby and there's no arguing about it. But with the missus here, it's different. In the three-point position, she's already in a flying attitude. On the takeoff run, the relative wind's parallel to the ground. So say the ground makes one leg of your angle of attack. Cord line makes the other leg. Angle of attack in three-point attitude, about 10 degrees. But with power on, the stalling angle for this airplane's about 19 degrees. 
So when you hold the tail down on the takeoff, you have a nice cozy margin of nine degrees below the stall angle. And when you leave the ground, the path of the relative wind changes so that the angle of attack actually decreases. You get maybe another four degrees of safety and you haven't a care in the world. Now let's dig a little deeper. Think of the forces at work when you take off as a team of little guys who are in there working for or against you all the time. For instance, gross weight of the airplane. On the ground, he bears down hard on the landing gear. When we're ready to start the takeoff run, you'll meet a pal of his, wheel drag. The harder gross weight bears down on the wheels, the bigger and stronger wheel drag gets. That's definitely not good, especially if your runway is soft or slushy. Think of lift as a kind of muscle man working from the wings, pulling up gross weight. Speed makes him pull harder. An increase in the angle of attack also makes him pull harder. Get the relationship between lift, weight on wheels, and wheel drag. The more lift, the less weight on wheels. Less weight on wheels, smaller wheel drag. Then, of course, there's thrust. He's your power and aerodynamic drag. He's with you all the time, except when you're parked on the ground. Now, let's try to visualize what happens on a two-point takeoff. At the start of the run, lift increases steadily. Lift takes more and more weight off the wheels. Taking weight off the wheels steadily reduces wheel drag. Then, just when things are looking good, you lift the tail. Angle of attack decreases. That cuts down lift. Lift lets weight go back down on the wheels, and wheel drag increases again. Aerodynamic drag is cut a little, but not enough to compensate for the extra wheel drag. Speed still won't build up as fast as it would with the tail down. Even on a smooth runway, you'll need more room and maybe 20 or 30 miles an hour more speed to get off than if you'd kept your tail down. If the runway's messed up with mud or slush or water, maybe you won't get off at all in the space you have. But keep the tail down. Take advantage of the three-point angle of attack and lift goes to work on gross weight right away. Wheel drag gets smaller and smaller. You'll be airborne at maybe 100 miles an hour and without using up all your runway. And that's something to remember when you're lined up in a nice homemade strip in the jungle with mud underneath you and trees dead ahead. Like her. Try a little problem when you get over the field. Say you're coming in after a long mission, you're a little short on gas, and when you arrive, the field's closed in. Beeline for an alternate base. No, Sal, you're the hell and gone from nowhere. You're lucky to have one base to come home to. Well, cut the end boards and hang around until she opens up. Well, you're to hover all right, but don't cut the end boards. She'll burn more coal on two than she will on four on long-range settings. Think it over. All right, here we are. Granite stuff straight as below, up to, say, 2,000. Don't know when we'll be able to find a hole in it. Instrument letdown's out. What are you going to do? you like it up here? like it better down a bit if I'm low on fuel. Need less power and less fuel for a given indicated airspeed. The air is not so thin. Props take fewer horses. Okay, that's part of it. When you get down to 8,000, you give the command for carburetor filters on, and you finally level off at around 500 feet above your theoretical overcast. When you level off above the overcast, the idea is to keep from going places. Now that's simple. Cut your speed down to 120, even if you have to reduce your RPM to 1250 to get it. Try it first with 1400 RPM. All right, reduce manifold pressure. 
try with 26 inches. Jettison the bombardier? Now your weight's all right. You've used up most of your gas on the way home, and I hope you didn't bring any bombs back. Cut your RPM down a little more. 1250 is the minimum. With this hovering maneuver, fuel consumption's cut down to about 95 gallons an hour. At the end of a mission, you'll have a light load, so it's absolutely safe. Keep your banks at a 10-degree angle and just sit it out. Regular helicopter. Time to go in, then. Landing instructions from the tower, weather, altimeter setting, and back to work again. When you're ready for a landing, be sure your co-pilot runs through the checklist. No matter how good you are, flying means fatigue, and fatigue does things to your memory. So if you want to bring in this property without an insurance claim, have everything checked in order. Altimeter, okay. Crew positions. Automatic pilot, off. Crew members at their proper stations. Side guns stowed. Ball turret guns up and pointing rear. Booster pumps on. Your power plant should be ready for full takeoff power in case a go-round is necessary. Mixtures auto-rich, intercoolers cold, carburetor filters on, wing de-icers off. That's important. Wing de-icer operation changes the stalling characteristics of the airplane. Tower, this is 641 on downwind leg, over. 641 on downwind leg, cleared to land, wheels down, over. Roger. Landing gear down. Down left. Down right. Wheel down, trailing antenna in. Check brakes and hydraulic pressure. Brakes okay. Pressure around 750. RPM 2100. Turbos set. Now we have power immediately available for a go round if we need it. Flap should be lowered on the downwind leg but not until air speeds below 147. One-third flaps on the downwing leg, full flaps on final approach. And if you have to go around, you don't need to milk up your flaps. They'll come up slowly enough. You hold air speed at 130 indicated on the base leg of the pattern. Then in a matter of seconds, you make your bank into the final approach. Flaps. High RPM. 120. 115. Don't close your throttles until you're sure of a landing. 112. 110. Freezer on. Hydraulic pressure's okay, otherwise you'd gun her and take off again. Cowl flaps open and locked. Turbos off. Booster pumps 
off. Wing flaps up. Get them up sooner if you have a muddy runway. Tail wheel unlocked. Generators. Generators off. Cutting the inboard engines is the co-pilot's duty normally. The pilot should keep his mind on his taxi. But it's quiet on the hangar apron today, and the instructor asks you to do it. Good thing, too, since you weren't too sharp about it. You can cut your inboards now. Uh, check turbos off first. You need engine oil pressure to open the waste gates. No, no. Rev them up to a thousand before you cut them. brakes? No, hold it until the chocks are in. If you set your brakes on hot drums, you'll bake the expander tubes. the ignition until the engines have stopped turning over. Golden Tower, this is 641. Mission complete. See that all other switches are off before turning off the batteries and the main line. Booster pumps off, landing gear, wing flaps, neutral. De-icer, anti-icer, off. Inverters? Inverters off only when the instruments have returned to neutral. Inverters off, batteries off, main line off. Block control surfaces. That's that, except for the bookwork. Just give them the facts. One more thing. Record the time of day and number of minutes of oil dilution if you were diluting in this. Well, how do you feel? Okay, I feel great. Remember, it's, it's just another airplane. It's a little bigger than most. But the fact that you're flying here means that You've moved into the big time. And the payoff is it's the safest crate you ever flew. That's part of it. Not all of it by a long shot, but part of it at least. It's a little more complicated than a buckboard wagon. Still, on the other hand, it's not quite as elaborate as a battleship. Make things as easy for yourself as you can by taking advantage of little devices like the flight computer and the load adjuster and the checklist. All the rest, and that's plenty, is up to you. But I guess by this time you understand that pretty well. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, Thank you for watching.